The moisture meter is probably the most talked about piece of equipment in the small craft surveying world. In this video, we're going to take a look at the Tramex Skipper Plus meter and the now discontinued but still very popular Sovereign Mark II. We're going to review how they should be used on a fiberglass boat such as this for assessing the moisture content of the hull and deck laminate and also the bulkheads. The International Institute of Marine Surveying does not endorse any particular brand of meter and there are a number of other capacitance type meters on the market such as Electrophysics and Novanex. So why does a surveyor use a moisture meter? Well, contrary to popular belief, gel coats, polyester resins and even epoxies are not waterproof, they're semi-permeable, allowing water molecules to enter the hull laminate when the boat is in the water. This movement is not initially caused by simple hydrostatic pressure forcing the water molecules into the hull. And when the boat's been out of the water for a while, that water will then dissipate and move back out of the laminate. But this process may take a few weeks. Most problems seem to arise when water collects between the gel coat and the first layer of chop strand mat. If there are voids present in the original layer process, this occurs more rapidly and the as the molecules have a site within which to aggregate. In the presence of unreactive binding agents, glycol or undercured resin, the water may even form new larger molecules that then attract more water into the void. And this is the process that should really be called, technically called, osmosis. It's this final process that may then lead to blisters underneath the gel coat which will become visible. In worst cases, the water or new chemical compounds may even hydrolyze the matrix and cause damage to the laminate itself, perhaps even causing it to become resin starved. It's therefore the surveyor's task to attempt to assess the state of the laminate during a survey, and the moisture meter is one of the tools that may help with this task. What's important to remember is that the moisture meter is simply another tool to assist with the inspection process, and physical and visual inspections are equally and perhaps even more important and may result in a more useful diagnosis. Today we're going to focus on the practical problems and the limitations of using moisture meters in the field rather than the theoretical analysis of the results. To learn more inter about interpreting the results, you should consult either the FRP module in the Institute Diploma or some of the other useful publications that are listed at the end of this video. To get accurate and meaningful readings from a moisture meter, we've got to follow a few simple rules and to work in a logical manner. If all surveyors use similar methods, the results can be compared. Firstly, we need to know how long the boat's been in the water and then how long the boat's been out of the water prior to the survey. A hull in good condition such as this, made with modern isothalic or vinyl ester resin, may show its resting moisture readings within a few hours of being lifted, perhaps even within the time frame of a lift and hold survey in the slings. But if the boat's been in the water for a couple of years, it may be 24 hours or more before the figures become meaningful. Vessels made entirely with orthothallic resin, which was common up until the late 1980s, may need a month ashore before meaningful numbers can be returned. It's therefore a difficult assessment to make to determine whether the readings that you're getting are a, re are a reflection of the long-term health of the laminate or a temporary wet state caused simply by the boat being immersed. The only accurate way to evaluate older boats is to take a series of measurements over a three to four week period and look at the trend. Additionally, other factors such as weather and the presence of anti-fouling paint or epoxy coatings will affect the drying rate. Secondly, extremes of temperature and humidity will affect any of the measurements that we take of the laminate. This becomes very important if the temperatures are near or below freezing and you should avoid taking any readings if the temperature is actually below freezing. Be careful in exposed marinas in the winter time as these conditions will cause the meter to record artificially low readings. This applies to all laminate types, not just sandwich cores. A very good article in Professional Boat Builder magazine in 1999, which I highly recommend reading, disputed this fact by doing analysis within the lab on frozen core samples and frozen laminate stacks. However, it's my experience that in practice, freezing temperatures do reduce readings. At the other end of the spectrum, 
If you're using a moisture meter to monitor the drying of a hull that has been peeled or blasted prior to a gel coat repair, ensure that the heaters or hot back pads have been turned off overnight to allow the hull temperature to stabilise. For this reason, an infrared thermometer such as this, which you can buy for 15 or 20 pounds, is a very useful tool. By simply pointing the meter at the hull laminate, you can get a quick and accurate reading of what the actual temperature of the laminate is. This one's currently reading about 18 degrees. And obviously we're on the sunny side. If we were to move on to the shady side, we'd get a different reading. And recording those sorts of readings will allow you to have much more consistent and, and repeatable results. As a minimum, air temperature and humidity must be measured and recorded with your results. And for that, you can purchase for a similar sort of price uh, an electronic thermometer and hygrometer, such as that. Before we start taking readings, we're going to take a look inside the boat and assess the internal structure and see how it may affect the meter. The Tramex and also the electrophysics moisture meters are capable of reading through laminate that is 25 millimeters thick. Although their sensitivity diminishes over distance, it does mean that bilge water, integral tanks, gas lines, wet buoyancy aids will all affect the readings, as modern hulls may only be 8 to 10 millimetres thick, unless you're right round underneath the keel where you'd expect it to be thicker. And remember, even if the bilge appears dry, a small salt residue will conduct electricity very effectively, giving misleading readings. Spurious external readings should always be checked by wiping the inside of the bilge with a bit of fresh water and drying it thoroughly. Another problem that's very common on modern sailing boats is the internal moulding or tray liner. Any voids in the bonding between the tray and the hull laminate will usually contain moisture and will result in artificially high figures. And as this water is likely to contain some salt, drying can be very difficult and very slow. Vessels such as Bavaria's often show high readings uh, immediately behind the keel and there's nothing wrong with the laminate, it's simply that some salt water has got in uh, between the hull and the tray. For all of these reasons, some surveyors like to use moisture meters on the inside rather than the outside, it's a very popular practice in the US. This does have many advantages, but it also means that the meter is reading from the drier side of the laminate and therefore you may underread the moisture between the laminate and the gel coat and it's this area that's likely to lead uh, to blistering. On troublesome hulls it'll be necessary to take readings on both sides just to be sure. To ensure the measurements are repeatable we need to mark out stations on the hull before taking readings. This can be done as part of the normal hull measurements using a suitable datum such as the aft perpendicular. On a small vessel with a hard chine it is possible to simply mark out stations using a tape measure along the hull side. Intervals should be 500 millimetres or 1 metre on very large vessels. Use chalk to mark the station numbers as it is easy to wipe off when you have finished. Before taking any readings always wipe the hull top sides to ensure there's no salt residue present on the hull. Using range 2 on the Tramex and reading off the comparative scale, we're interested in the comparison between the top sides and the hull below the waterline. Of course it's also possible to get high moisture levels and even blisters in the top sides, but this is not particularly common. Working 200 to 300 millimetres above the waterline, expect the top side readings to be between 5 on new boats to 25 on older vessels. Remember that internal foam back liners will dramatically increase these readings. We then take measurements working vertically down the hull. The exact location of the meter may be determined by spray rails, chines or bilge keels, but try and get readings every 300 millimetres. Ensure you write these down for each station before proceeding and highlight or circle any unusually high readings that will require follow-up on the inside of the vessel. If working on a hull that is being spot repaired, such as this, or if the gel coat has been stripped completely, it's normal practice to mark the readings directly on the hull so that you can easily compare readings when you return to monitor the drying process. However, this is not advisable when doing a pre-purchase survey as it will understandably upset the broker or current owner. When doing a pre-purchase survey, always make sure that you remove all chalk marks when you're finished.
Here in the lab, we're going to take a closer look at the two meters. Both meters operate on the same principle. They transmit a radio frequency from one electrode to the other electrode. They then convert this information into a moisture meter reading or moisture content reading of the wood or the GRP on an analog scale. The sovereign uses a remote head and the same principle, the electrodes are just simply much smaller. And as we'll see later, this is one of its limitations which can actually be used to, to an advantage. The smaller electrodes mean that it doesn't transmit as deep into the laminate or the wood structure. The sovereign also has two pins and they can be used for measuring timber using the more conventional resistance method for measuring moisture content. To get the two pins to operate, you hold the red button down and then read off the dial. Let's take a look at the scales on the two meters. The Tramex has three settings or ranges which are selected by pressing the range button in the center here. The first scale is the timber scale. This has been calibrated for a wood with a specific gravity of about 0.6, something such as mahogany. When reading timber with the meter, try and align the electrodes underneath here with the grain of the wood to get consistent readings. When we place this onto the wood, push down firmly and on scale one, we're getting a reading of just over 10%. If we compare that now with the sovereign meter, on the sovereign meter for reading uh, items such as wood, we'll start by selecting range A, it's fully explained in the booklet that comes with the meter. Select range A, the first thing we do is set the zero using the middle button, it's important to set it to back to zero each time, particularly if the battery is failing at all. And then we use this head here, push down firmly onto the wood, and we get a symbol reading of just over 10 or 11% moisture. So that is reading the, the moisture content of this piece of wood by weight. And of course, this wood's been, uh, this has been kept indoors in a modern building, and it's stabilized now at around between 10 and 11%, which is what you'd expect for a wood such as mahogany. Scale two on the Tramex meter is the main scale that is used for surveying work on fiberglass hulls. We move on to scale two. Now, instead of reading from five to 30% moisture, which is what scale one read in, we're now reading a, in a comparative scale from zero to 100. Now, there is no direct correlation between these figures and the moisture content of the fiberglass because fiberglass varies depending on the types of resins used, different fibers and different laminate stacks. So this reading we'll actually use to compare between the drier area above the waterline and then the area below the waterline. So if we take a look with a piece of flat fiberglass, this is about five millimeters thick with a gel coated surface, place the meter onto the fiberglass and press down firmly and we're getting a reading here of 20 points on the comparative scale. Same with the Sovereign meter. We actually stay on scale A. Uh, the technology within the Sovereign is slightly different. Again, we'd start by set, setting the uh, meter to zero. And then the probe gets placed onto the fiberglass and pushed down and we're getting a reading on, on the comparative scale on the Sovereign of just over 10. And there's no direct correlation between the two meters in this respect, hence the term comparative or relative scale. And it is difficult because of the, the different technology in the meters to therefore directly compare the two meters. Let's just take a look at some other substances that you might, some fibers that you might come across in the field. This is a sandwich core. Moisture meters are very useful for detecting uh, moisture within a core. However, this is from a, a modern racing yacht and you can see that it's got carbon fiber skins. And the moisture meter when placed on carbon fiber, you can see immediately goes off to a full scale deflection, even though this is a completely dry laminate stack. 
and that's because carbon or graphite is a very good conductor. So we've got to be careful of, of knowing what fibres are within the laminate stack. Certain resins used in a number of American powerboat manufacturers have fire resistant or fire retardant products within them and they can give the same sort of readings as carbon fibre and give you a full scale deflection even when the laminate stack is completely dry. We've got another foam core sandwich here and this just shows some of the limitations and problems when using the larger electrodes of the Tramex it is important that both these electrodes are in full contact with the surface and obviously if you're working on a radius it becomes difficult to do so and you might find that you have to alter the way the meter lies move it down down the radius down the curve to get it to lie flat that is one of the advantages with the smaller sovereign head is that even on quite sharp bends it's possible to get that head to lie flat. The Tramex meter and also the electrophysics meters are both known for being very sensitive and capable of reading up to 25 millimeters thick fiberglass and detecting moisture on the other side. If we take a look at a realistic uh, laminate stack here. This is a 10 millimeter thick laminate stack with some paint samples on it. We're going to take a look at how sensitive these meters are when there are moist items behind the laminate. So these would be false readings. Here we've got a slightly damp cloth. If we place the cloth underneath the laminate stack, this stack's about uh, just under 10 millimeters thick. And we've got bare gel coat here with no paint on it. We're still on scale two on the Tramex. If we place it down, we're getting an almost full scale deflection. We're getting about 90 points on the comparative scale. So the Tramex clearly is sensitive enough to read a damp object behind it. And so items such as buoyancy aids or integral tanks or anything within the boat might cause uh, a problem and give you a false reading when uh, measuring with the Tramex. On the other hand, with the Sovereign, we're still on scale A here, and we're set at it calibrated down to zero. If we place that onto the same area, we get a reading exactly the same, just over 10, that we were getting previously on the fiberglass without the uh, damp cloth behind. So the Sovereign is less sensitive. Now, some people would say that that's a weakness. However, as we know that the majority of blisters form in the layer, between the gel coat and the laminate itself, the advantage of the sovereign